Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies. Welcome to this episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. What we're going to be talking about in this episode is we're going to be talking about Sepenkels, Neutral Steer, Ackerman, and I'm going to give you some food for thought to have a little bit of a play with at the end of uh, this uh, episode slash tutorial. To kick this discussion off, we're going to go into the full equation. I'm going to give you a bit of a teaser of the full equations of motion. And really our goal in that teaser is to introduce you to how to derive slip angles and slip ratios. I'm then going to talk about understeer and oversteer, what they, uh, what they actually mean and how we can use this to our advantage. Then I'm going to introduce you to one of the most powerful analysis tools I've ever used, which is called the concept of the neutral steer channel. And if you can get your head around it, I guarantee you it will transform the way you look at data. And lastly, we're going to talk about Ackerman, and I'm going to all send you away with um, some food for thought. To kick off this discussion, let's have a look at the free body diagram of the tyre forces acting on the car. Now, as you can see, we've got a car with a centre of gravity. Now, to keep this discussion simple, I'm going to assume the car is symmetric. For those of you who are running highly asymmetric cars, in particular, where the CG line is not in the same location as um, the car centre line, that's okay. Everything I'm saying still applies. The no all that happens is that you just need to change the numbers a little bit. So as we can see here, we've got a car with um, a forward vehicle speed VX, a lateral speed VY, and you can see that we've got our four slip angles. Now, let's just go over our nomenclature here very quickly. One is our front left tyre, two is our um, front right tyre, three is our rear left tyre, and four is our rear right tyre. And as we can see, we've got slip angles uh, our, our lateral forces and longitudinal forces are in line and perpendicular to the slip angle lines. Now, how do we go about deriving the slip angles? The process is actually incredibly simple. The way you derive a slip angle is it's effectively the side is effectively the lateral velocity of the tire divided by the forward speed. That's it. And as you can see with our free body diagram here, as we start applying a VY, VX, etc., etc., to uh, 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 to this, all of a sudden, deriving this actually becomes really, really straightforward. And if anything, it falls out in about five seconds. And to um, cut the process a little bit, this is what it will look like. Now, bear in mind, from time to time. If you go through and do it directly with sideways, uh, with um, so, uh, with um, things such as sideways speed, etc., etc., uh, you will wind up as the negative of this. These numbers were actually derived from Wong theory of ground vehicles. Now, I I personally like this way of representing it because because of my aerospace background, this basically presents me as the angles being positive for a right-hand turn, and that comes into um, how I like to think about um, SI units, you will see some derivations, most notably those in Millikan, where you have these slip angles being the other way around. That is not wrong. They are, they are both right. Just bear in mind, though, for those um, results where you have the slip angles the other way around, just remember your tyre force curves that you'll be using need to be the other way around. There will be some of you who might get a little grumpy with this. I can tell you right now, I have tested both of these methods back to back and they come out exactly the same. So there's no need really to uh, get um, terribly worried about the semantics of where these wind up. But the important thing though, is the fact that, uh, the, import, uh, 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 the critical thing is the fact that they will wind up uh, they will wind up by uh, it's more a personal preference thing so just keep that one in mind so what we've got here is that effectively the front slip angle is is steer angle minus uh, uh, minus the uh, sideways velocity of the front tire which is effectively a moment arm at the front multiplied by the URA plus vy on the uh, on vx for the rears it's effectively the difference between the yaw rate uh, 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 between um, the yaw rate velocity at to the rear subtracted by uh, the sideways velocity divided by the f uh, uh, divided by uh, the forward speed. That's it. That's all. Uh, that's all. Uh, uh, that's all there is to. That's all there is to it. Now, 
The beauty about this is that you'll see here that we've got a track front and a track rear that offsets our um, front left, front right, rear left and rear right slip angles. This has a small but very, very, uh, this has a small but a profound, uh, but I won't say a profound effect, but an effect that you need to be keeping in the back of your mind. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Now, what do we mean by understeer and oversteer? Now, typically with the way that um, race uh, that uh, race engineering has evolved, you will see understeer or uh, in um, American terms, push or oversteer, or um, I've sometimes uh, there are some parts um, in North America that describe it as loose. What we've got there, uh, what we've got there, is that when we're understeering, we've got um, the front slip angle is greater than the rear slip angle, and what that effectively is telling us is that we need to prompt the car to go into the corner. Vis-a-vis, -vis, if we didn't prompt it to, to go into the corner, it would want to keep. In an extreme example, it would want to keep going straight ahead into the wall, um, uh, which would basically lead your race car driver to describe your car's handling in negative terms. But one first thing I really want to talk about in terms of um, understeer and oversteer, just remember, I just want to go back here to um, the derivation of our slip angles. One thing that really hit me between the nose, and this was about, and when it hit me between the nose, it really transformed the way I looked at data, is the fact that the steer angle is effectively a very effective measure of the difference between what the front slip angles are doing and the rear slip angles are doing combined with the forces that you have on the car. If you can get your head around that, you are really going to see, you're really going to be able to make very good use of your steer channel, which is one of the reasons when I calibrate my steer channels, I actually like to show my steering input as being applied at the tyre as opposed to um, applied at the steering wheel. You'll see a lot of guys, a, a lot of data set up with steering being applied at the steering wheel. I personally like to view it at to the tyre for that very reason that it gives me a very good handle on my understeer and oversteer. Now, on oversteer, the rear step angles are greater than the front step angles. What that's telling you is as you turn into a corner, the car needs no prompting. If anything, you need to correct. An extreme example of that is uh, drifting where you have uh, guys deliberately throwing the car into an oversteer situation so um, uh, you can generate an awful lot of tire, uh, tire smoke as you go around uh, the corner and it looks really cool. And i got to admit, um, I do have a little bit of a soft spot uh, for, uh, for, dr uh, for drifting, but that's effectively what oversteer is. Now, let's talk about neutral steer and static stability. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a shortcut. Now, the beauty about this little tool, in reality, I actually first arrived this when a race engineer I was working for said to me, look, I can't get an internal uh, understeer oversteer channel to work. Can you see what you can do about it? And effectively, I sat with the back of an envelope and derived this in approximately five minutes. So the key, though, is that we're going to use the bicycle equations of motion. So what do I mean by the bicycle equations of motion, going back to our slip angles, we're effectively ignoring our track front and track rear offsets and effectively just approximating the front slip angle as, uh, uh, as basically delta minus a times r plus vy on vx and the rears is basically being b times r minus vy on v on vx so and we really just are doing that for simplicity now neutral steer is defined as when the front slip angles are equal to the rear slip angle so if you go through and equate alpha front and alpha rear you'll find that the neutral steer is wheelbase times the yaw rate divided by the uh, forward velocity Vx. This is really, really, really key, and you can derive this in two seconds flat. Now, here comes a magic trick. Ay can be approximated as Vx times r. Now, in reality, the true lateral acceleration is, in fact, Vx times r plus Vy dot. However, this is one of the few cases where you can actually get away with ignoring a little bit of a transient because it actually only adds a very small error to it. So you can approximate R by being uh, 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 you can approximate R as being the measured lateral acceleration divided by the forward vehicle speed. Let me say that again. You can approximate your rate as the measured lateral acceleration divided by the forward vehicle speed. Why do we need to do that? Let's have a look. 
If we approximate that, we'll find that delta neutral is wheelbase times AY on VX squared, which is wheelbase times inverse corner radius. So what that means, guys, is to get a racing line, you don't need to get a race car and tootle around the circuit at 60 kilometers per hour. All you need to do is have a good lateral accelerometer from a good flying lap and, and, um, uh, and uh, give it a little bit of a filter. That will give you the actual neutral steer channel. And where it really comes into play is right here. What I've done in this plot is uh, the black uh, is I've got a, a plot of steer, speed, and throttle. Now, as we can see here, the steer, uh, the speed, the speed is in black. The steer, the slightly jaggedy line, is a dark purple color, and the throttle is a green color. That uh, this sort of light purplish magnetic color is the neutral steer channel, and all of a sudden, you can see at an instant what the car is doing. Any steer angle below the neutral steer line means the car is oversteering and uh, it means the car is oversteering. The millisecond that neutral steer line is uh, uh, that uh, the steer the steering angle is over the neutral steer line, it's oversteer. And the beauty about this is at an instant you can see what the car is doing. I actually call this my driver lot. I call this one of my key driver lie detectors. If I've got a driver who's either gotten a bit freaked out, doesn't know, uh, you know, is a, is, is, has got a little bit muddled in the head, I always use this as a sanity check. The other thing too is if you've got a really good driver who's on it, this neutral steer line is a very, very good benchmark in terms of what the stability is doing. I guarantee you start using this at length, guys. It's going to transform the way you're going to use um, steer data, and you can and it'll be a and this has saved my neck on more occasions than I care to remember. So. To wrap up this discussion, let's have a little chat about Ackerman, and I'm going to give you all some food for thought. Okay, Ackerman is a consequence of the fact that the inside and outside tyres need to run at a slightly different radius from each other. And as we can see, the inside tyres, if we're going to minimise uh, uh, tyre uh, tire scrub, is going to have to run at a slightly, uh, at a slightly uh, tighter tyre radius than what uh, the ones on the outside are going to do. And when uh, the automotive industry was in its infancy, uh, back in the, early, the late 19th century, early 20th century, you had a lot of people who were actually doing this because basically back then, I mean, cars were uh, uh, cars were breathtakingly slow. I mean, if you, I mean, it's really motoring in a motor car back then would have been 60 kilometers per hour, which a modern car would probably do, it wouldn't even break a sweat at. Now, the whole idea of Ackerman is that to minimise tyre scrub is that you would put slightly more tyre, uh, uh, more uh, steer on the inside tyre than you do on the outside tyre. Now, in reality, as cars have gotten faster, as you've gotten uh, a more load transfer, you now apply things such as what we call anti ackerman which is you give the front, the outside front tyre more steering lock than what you do on the inside rear tyre. And that's basically taking advantage of the fact that, uh, particularly when you've got significant amounts of load transfer, the outside front tyre is doing an awful lot of the work. Now, here's my challenge and where I'm going to sort of give you guys some food for thought. Ackerman tends to be one of these issues that from time to time will flare up and you get people going, oh yeah, oh, you really need to run it, it's really important, etc., etc." And then you get other people who will go through and go, oh yeah, whatever, it's the cherry on top, etc., etc." You know what? I know what I think about this matter, but you know what? I'm not going to tell you. And you know why? Because I'm going to get you to figure it out for yourself. Now, let me give you some rough rules of thumb to help you in this discussion. First things first, peak slip angles for a typical um, uh, for typical racing tyres are about six to seven degrees. That's peak slip angle. Sometimes you'll see this push to about nine degrees, but six to seven degrees is a good rough rule of thumb. Now, the first thing that I want you to do is use this approximation of your rate as being AY divided by VX, a measured lateral acceleration on forward vehicle speed. So that's uh, so that's your first uh, uh, so that's your first step. Your next step is to use the bicycle equations of motions to approximate effectively what your VY should be. So 
what you would do is typically you would set alpha front at um, six degrees or let me or 0.1047 of a radian now for these for these calculations i would strongly recommend you strict si units also to use angles in terms of radians if you start to use anything else i guarantee you you are going to head screw yourself so fast you won't know where to start so use si units i realize there are some people in north america who are going to get annoyed uh, at this and quite frankly, I don't care because quite frankly, any any measurement system that uses the slug as its measure of density, as far as I'm concerned, intellectually flawed. But even though that's a slight humorous take on it, in all seriousness, to keep your discussion simple, use um, SI units. So, and lastly, what we're going to do then is, so that approximates your VY, then go back to your... Uh, the, uh, to your actual pick slip, pick slip angles, and really, now that you know your yaw rate and you know your trunk uh, and you know your uh, front track, plug in, um, evaluate alpha one and alpha two for the case where you don't have any toe assistance, and then start to play around and see what sort of numbers you, um, uh, uh, what sort of numbers, uh, what the actual slip angle numbers do. I think you're going to find that's going to be exceptionally revealing. The other thing I'll, going, I'll get you to do is play with the tracks. Then you can see where things really, really become significant. So throw some mud on the wall, have some fun, and we'll catch you in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner.